mystery be? Hello and welcome to Scriptonite Reacts. I'm Scriptonite and this is a first for Scriptonite Reacts. We're doing a full series review because we have now finished our journey of the leftovers. It was fantastic. And this video is going to answer some of the questions that you've asked me in the comment section so that we can wrap up the show, hopefully with none of you with questions hanging in the air. But if there is anything I haven't answered in this, by all means, put it in the comment section and we can carry on the discussion. So the things I'm going to cover today are what I think the show was about and what were my personal favourite seasons, episodes and moments. And also tell you where the show ranks overall in my Hall of Fame of TV shows. And I think the thing to remember when we do this is this is just my view. I don't think it's right. I don't think it's true. It's just my personal take on the situation. And I'm sure that each of you will have your own version of this. And what I'd really love is if you could use the comment section to share with me what what would you would put in this video if it were you? What would your favourite seasons, moments and episodes be? Where does The Leftovers rank when you think about your all-time favourite TV shows? I really would be interested to hear. And um, without further ado, let's crack on. If you read a blurb for the show, what it says is that it's about 140 million people vanishing from the earth at the same moment, all of a sudden. And that's what drew me in to watch it. But I think, as we all know, this show is about a lot more than The Sudden Departures. And it's actually barely about The Sudden Departures. For me, this show is about loss. It's about grief. It's also about commitment and letting go. And I'll explain a bit about that. So loss, everyone in the show, all of our main characters lose something. You know, whether they lost people in the departure or not, they've all lost something. It could be a piece of themselves. It could be a relationship that was really important to them. You know, people that they love could have died, you know, like Meg. People go into vegetative states, you know, as Matt experienced with his wife Mary and so it goes and, and people lose their minds you know Chief, both Chief Garvey's Kevin Senior and Kevin Junior experience you know losing their minds as do several other characters but we'll get into that later and then it's grief so grief as a response to loss and we see lots of different kinds of grieving in the show and ways of grieving and stages of that grief cycle and some people never make it through this, through the cycle obviously we have to remember the grief cycle isn't just stages that you go through and you come out the other end and you're and you're fine it's really important to understand that the grief cycle is literally a cycle that you can go through in a day every day for the rest of your life you can go through it you know point to point all out in an ad hoc fashion or you can actually go through stages and come out of the other side so there are lots of different ways to grieve, and I love the way that the show explored that. The show is also about commitment, what it means to commit to something. And one of the principal characters that we explore that with is Kevin. If you think about the way that Kevin feels about being a father, about being the chief of police, about being a husband and later a partner with Nora, his battle over commitment about no kidding, I'm in this 100% and I'm responsible for, for generating ongoing enthusiasm about that. Like that's a massive part of Kevin's character and he really wrestles with it and I don't really think he ever gets a grip on it, to be honest, but we'll talk more about that later. And finally, it's letting go which feels like the opposite of commitment, but it's not. It's, for me, letting go is about choosing what you're committed to. And there can be some things that in the past we've chosen to be committed to that no longer make any sense. You know, we could commit to being unhappy. Sometimes we just really get stuck in a feeling. 
and we sort of kind of commit to it you know we commit to our unhappiness and one of the scenes that i think exemplifies that is in guest when nora is asked do you want to feel this way i lost everyone i lost everything you fucking fraud you fucking liar you're not in pain because if you were in pain you would know there is no moving on You want to feel this way? Yeah, I want to feel this way. And you know, the obvious answer anyone gives if someone asks, Do you want to be sad? You know, of course not. That's not actually true. Sometimes we actually do want to be sad. You know, there's a period of time that we feel it's appropriate or we just really need to mourn something or someone that we've lost. And we're really okay, we're committed to being sad for that period of time. And that's great, that's healthy, but there does come a point where we have to choose if we're gonna stay there or if we're gonna move on. And that requires letting go, you know, really accepting a situation or a person as they are and as they are not. And that's a toughie. And watching the characters wrestle with that in this is fantastic. I'm gonna use an example of two pairs of characters that exemplify those four issues. You know, loss, grief, commitment, and letting go. If you look at, and we're going to look at Nora and Kevin on the one hand, and we're going to look at Laurie and John on the other, because this is such a brilliant, these are such brilliant case studies. The difference between their journey on the show is out of this world. So bear with me. Firstly, let's take a look at Laurie season one. I want to believe it can all go back to the way it was. That's what Jill said. It's easier because I'm a coward. And I couldn't take the pain. Not again. I know that's not fair, Kevin. So that season, we saw Laurie as a suicidal cultist who had abandoned her family and chosen to join a cult which basically severed all attachments, all feelings, all personality and character, and ultimately their lives. She was done. You know, she was absolutely done with this world, with everyone she loved, and with every feeling that she'd ever had, to such a degree that she allowed her own daughter to nearly die with her. It was not a bright start for Laurie. That's how we met her. That's the character that we were introduced to. And now let's take a look at John in season two. Evie loved her mother. She loved her brother. And she loved me. So why in God's name would she do this to us? Maybe she didn't. What? I love you. Uh, who, who knows what goes through people's heads? You know, your daughter. So this is a guy just like Laurie, who is so impacted by grief and loss, and so unwilling to consider being committed to anything else or to letting go of the pain that he's suffering, that he's going round burning down people's houses who think differently to him who offer what he considers false hope to people. And it even comes to the point where when his views of his own daughter are challenged by Kevin, he literally shoots him. He tried to kill him. You know, that's the extreme lengths to which John was willing to go at that point in time to defend his feelings, his point of view. <laughs> Un unbelievable. Now, here are a couple of scenes between John and Laurie in season three that just for me sum up how far these characters could have come. Because neither of them could have had these conversations in this way any earlier in their journey than here. 
and just look at the difference. You used to burn men's houses down for pretending to be things they're not. What happened to you, John? He grew up. What happened to your wrath? It's a sin! <sighs> he found peace. Kevin told her he saw eventually. Here. In Australia. Is that true? It... It wasn't her. What he saw was that it was a... Uh, it was a manifestation of... It wasn't... She wasn't real. And if I told you, you would have... I didn't want to hurt you. wouldn't have told me either. Do you want Kevin to ask Evie why she left her family? No. I asked him to give her a message. I want her to know that she was loved. Firstly, we've got the scene where John finds out that Laurie knew that Kevin could have possibly seen Evie in Melbourne. Season two, John, would have been like, fuck you, Laurie, off the boat, into Melbourne, breaking bones to track down what ultimately would have been a stranger. Earlier, Laurie would have been wrestling with this, she would have been guilty, she'd have been, you know, there are, there are lots of reactions that Laurie could have had. But she was honest and she wasn't cruel with that honesty and she believed the answer that she got from John, she truly trusted him. That was fantastic. The second scene comes from episode six of season three, which is certified. Now contrast that with Kevin and Nora who I would argue, and this may be a controversial point, but bear with me, this is just my view, barely change from season one to the finale. That doesn't mean they're always the same. You know, Nora and Kevin are both very similar characters in the sense that they both have this ability to be extraordinarily badass and brave to be really funny and let's just be honest about it people really hot <laughs> really really sexy and they can create amazing intimacy and they can make people feel really loved um, and all of that stuff and both of them are also cowards you know, they bulk from intimacy, they bulk from honesty, they pretend because they feel like it's easier than taking the risk of being, you know, emotionally vulnerable. They're scared of each other, they're scared of what's possible and not possible in their relationship with each other and with their other partners. And although they they are both of those things or different elements of those things throughout the program, neither of them really commits to being different. You know, maybe they did it at the end of the finale, but we don't know because we don't see them. Like the psychological explanation for the processes that he went through in the international assassin and, you know, later on in the most powerful man on earth and his identical twin brother, all of that stuff, what he's trying to put to bed, what elements of his personality he's letting go. But if you remember, think on about that little, you know, the romance novel that they read towards the end of The Most Powerful Man on Earth and his identical twin brother. You know, and 
what is Kevin scared of? You know, he will cross continents. He will, you know, do this, he will do that. But he won't, he's terrified of her. He's terrified of being vulnerable. He's terrified of being honest. He's terrified of, you know, falling into her arms and being taken care of. And then in the finale, what do we find? You know, he came out of that dream. Nora had gone off. He does this extraordinarily courageous thing of never giving up, of retaining his commitment to her. He's, every year he's used his two weeks of leave to go to Australia and search for her, taking a photo around. You know, he's done all of that. His life's on hold. He's not having any other romantic relationships that we know of. You know, he's like a single-minded obsession with tracking Nora down, which you can either see as awful or enormously romantic and committed, you know, a refusal to give up on someone and and something. And then what does he do when, when he finds her? He does the same exact, the exact same thing that he did in season one and season two. He lies. He creates a pretense. He creates a new pretense. We just met once. Now we're going to start again. Again, two interpretations of that. I totally get how you could watch that and go, oh, that's, you know, that's so romantic. He's just, you know, it's a kind of forgiveness for those things. I would argue it's not. I would argue once again, and in fairness, Kevin agrees with me because he admitted it himself in the finale, that what he was doing was based on fear. He was worried it was too late. And he hated all the things that he said. He couldn't live with them and he just wanted to step over it and create something new and not go through the pain of revisiting all of that over again which of course doesn't we all know that doesn't work any of you in a relationship who've ever had a relationship know that any dust that you brush under the rug is going to come back out at some point and it's not it's not a good look it's way way better to just be honest and deal with things in the moment and really deal with them fully than it is to try and pretend that, that nothing happened. So that's Kevin. And Nora's the same. You know, Nora's role is kind of similar. You know, in both seasons, it was Nora who snapped and ran away saying, this isn't true, this isn't real, or I can't cope with the situation that we're in. You know, she ran. What did change in the finale was Nora gave Kevin her honesty, Kevin gave Nora his honesty, and both of them stayed at the table. So I'm, I'm writing for myself that in that moment, and not a second before it, in that moment, Kevin and Nora caught up a little bit with Laurie and John. And where they got to was that they had their grief, they had their loss, but they were committed to each other and they were letting go of, you know, the the dishonesty, the absence of trust, you know, all of the, all of the bad things. They were there. That's how I'm going to interpret it. There's a million ways to interpret the ending because it wasn't explicit. It was, I believe, deliberately ambiguous. That is what The Leftovers was about for me. Let the mystery be.